Welcome to this event. Um, for those of you who don't, me, don't know me, I'm James Trussell. Um, I'm the faculty here and at the Office of Population Research. Pam Bellock graduated with honors from Princeton University in 1985 with a major in international relations at the Woodrow Wilson School here uh, and a minor in East Asian studies. Um, she studied Mandarin, music, and took a range of social science, English, and science classes. And she played ultimate frisbee on the men's team since at that point there was no women's team. She was then awarded a Fulbright Scholar to the Philippines. Almost immediately after arriving, she started her career as a journalist, as a freelance correspondent in Asia, working primarily for the San Francisco Chronicle, but also for other papers and news services. After a stint in Asia, she returned to the US and took a staff job with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, whose editor at the time was the journalistic powerhouse Bill Kovac, former Washington bureau chief of the New York Times. She then worked at the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, led by the legendary editor Eugene Roberts, also a former national editor of the New York Times. You see a pattern here? Um, Pam was destined for the New York Times. She joined the New York Times in 1995 as a general assignment reporter on the Metropolitan Desk. She describes um, herself as, quote, feeling rather stunned and win weak need when Joe Lelival offered her the job. In 1997, she became the Midwest Bureau Chief based in Chicago and covering 11 states. In 2001, she became the New England Bureau Chief based in Boston. In 2007, she was awarded a Knight Fellowship to spend a year uh, studying science journalism at MIT and Harvard. And in 2009, she began covering health and science for the Times. At last count this morning, she has published 1,111 pieces in the New York Times. Although when I looked two weeks ago, you had published 1,124. So some of your pieces have disappeared <laughs> unpublished in the last two weeks. Now, I've just described to you Pam Bellock's star reporter for, and certainly my favorite reporter at the New York Times. Let me close with three other images of Pam. She's an accomplished musician who plays jazz flute and composes music. Her jazz group, Equilibrium, plays regular gigs in New York City. I will return to this at the very end. She's also a gifted storyteller. Her book, Island Practice, which she will sign afterwards, um, for any of you who want to buy it, is a, is a true tale about a colorful and contrarian doctor on Nantucket who has performed surgery with scalpels he carved from obsidian, made house calls to a hermit who lived in an underground house in a blindy blue, treated uh, patients ranging from Kennedy relatives to a sheet with prolapsed uterus, and diagnosed everything from tularemia to toe tourniquets uh, syndrome. Um, Island Practice has been optioned for a television series uh, by Imagine Television in 20th Century Fox. And I have read it and it's absolutely fantastic. I couldn't put it down. Finally, she is an ice skating mom. Is that what you're called? I know a soccer mom. She's an ice skating mom. Um, she was the first national editor at the Times to give birth. Her two daughters, Ariel and Jillian, are gold medal skaters. She spent countless hours in the ice skating rinks um, and she sent um, her book editor for Ireland Practice uh, almost as many emails from skating rinks as while commuting on trains between her home in Connecticut and New York. Her favorite Tears of Joy story involves skating. One of her daughters decided to skate her program to a tune that Pam wrote and recorded with her jazz group, and just before the performance, she skated over to the MC, asked for the microphone, and announced to the whole crowd, I just want to say that my mom wrote this music, and this is dedicated to her. I love you, Mom. She will talk to us today about cats, condoms, and other conundrums. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Professor Trussell. That was a wonderful introduction, and you had to go and tell the tear-jerking story there just before I get up and talk. But, um, 
It's really, it's an incredible honor for me to be here. Um, and I want to thank um, uh, Dean Rouse and the wonderful staff at the Woodrow Wilson School for being just so um, accommodating and, and helpful with every logistical arrangement. They're, they're really great. Um, it's also a little daunting um, just to be back in this room where I spent so much time as a student. And, you know, in the last um, few months, I've spoken at Stanford, Berkeley, um, Yale. Those schools are okay. Uh, <laughs> but really, nobody does things like Princeton. And I, I, I mean that in every way. I was asked um, to uh, give a talk about my book for the Princeton Association of Nantucket. And, you know, Nantucket, Moby Dick, Wales. I swear those guys had almost an entire wardrobe outfitted with whales with tiger stripes. And <laughs> I, I, really, I don't think it, I think Princeton is the only place that inspires that kind of enthusiasm. Um, so covering health and science, um, you, you guys can hear me okay, right, by the way? Okay. Um, covering health and science for the New York Times um, involves communicating to the public about issues that are can be controversial, uh, complex, and can really make a difference in people's lives. And it's a responsibility that we take very seriously. Um, and, you know, communication, obviously, is a two-way street. Uh, and the public is not shy about communicating back to us. Um, so I thought, just to give you a little taste of one aspect of my job, I'd start out by sharing some things that um, readers have shared with us. Um, so here's, um, these are all emails that I've received. So here's one. Since you are so interested in medical science, why don't you do an in-depth study on the zapper? I know for a fact that this cheap little device works well and is designed to kill all viruses, including HIV, AIDS, herpes, cancer, leukemia, etc. Are you willing to do the story or are you going to chicken out too? I sincerely hope you can show a little bit of nerve by showing the zapper in the New York Times. Go for it, or chicken out. Have a nice day. <laughs> so I always like a challenge, and so I, I looked it up. And uh, did I see this one? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so this is the zapper, and this kid, um, if you can see, has a little angel on it, and I think that's because in um, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies, it not only cured your cancer and your herpes, but it also absolved you of all your venial and mortal sins. <laughs> <laughs> so stay tuned, you know, we'll do a five-part series on the zapper coming soon. Um, now, not every reader, to be fair, bothers to say, how would I stay? That was a nice touch. Um, especially those who like their science mixed uh, or mangled, as the case may be, with politics. Um, so here's one um, email that I received. The subject line was homosexuality, preventable, treatable. And the te text said, four decades of the fraud of gay scam, the truth will out. No thanks to you, quote unquote, journalists. <laughs> so given the tone, I mean, I was thankful that the subject line wasn't journalism, preventable, treatable. <laughs> but, you know, from the other side of the aisle, I, I received this about what one would think would be a pretty apolitical subject. Um, it's, um, I wrote a story about the discovery of the world's oldest leather shoe. And this was the email. Maybe I'm too easily offended lately, but this sentence stuck with me from your article about the 5,500 year old leather shoe. It could have fit a small man or a teenager, but was most likely worn by a woman. She goes on, why is a shoe by default belonging to a man? Why not it was most likely a woman's shoe, though it could have been also worn by a small man? Crazy, huh? Women wearing actual shoes. What's next? Cows wearing sweaters? <clears throat> so I was tempted to write back and suggest that this reader could kind of work out her anger by blowing 800 bucks on a pair of patent leather Jimmy Choo's. But, uh, I, I didn't, not particularly times in. Um, and anyway, I got distracted by this email. Hello, I just wanted to touch base with you and see if you are still interested in opening up a merchant account for your medical marijuana business. <laughs> I know that it's hard to place your industry, but I have relationships with several banks and can set you up to accept credit cards, no problem. Um, 
So I actually, I actually haven't written in those whatever 1100. 24 stories. I, there's not one about medical marijuana that I can recall, but there's a, there is a section in Island Practice um, where the doctor illegally commissions a stoner um, to make marijuana cookies and marijuana um, jello pudding pops. So I, I'm assuming that that's where this comes from, but either way, I'm now uh, set up to accept credit cards. And, uh, <laughs> Anyway, I, um, obviously I'm picking these for their entertainment value and, you know, we, we get many um, uh, emails with good questions, um, appreciation for tackling a difficult subject, thoughtful ideas, um, and really why else would the Chinese and the Syrians have been hacking into our email accounts in the last few months. Um, now, as these notes suggest, I, I have a pretty wide-ranging portfolio as even covering health and science. So I, I write a lot about medical and health subjects, um, occasionally about things biological or anthropological. Um, and because I'm a musician, I occasionally write about the science of music. Um, but overall, I would say the consistent thing that I look for is stories that are surprising um, or counterintuitive. And, and when possible, I try to illustrate how real people can be affected, um, uh, or how the, the science of the story would, could relate to actual real people. So, <clears throat> for example, I was asked to write about a study on um, body mass index and mortality, which found that people who fall into the overweight category actually have a lower risk of death than people of normal weight. Um, and this raises some questions about whether uh, BMI, which is a ratio of height to weight, is, is really a good indicator of health. And, and, you know, maybe there are times that a little extra weight can be beneficial. Um, but I decided instead of just writing about the study that I would illustrate this story with the tale of Elsie Scheel, who was a student at Cornell University in 1912. And um, at Cornell, they had something called the Medical Examiner of the Coeds. I don't remember this at Princeton when I was here. I don't know if they do. Um, and this, this medical expert pronounced Elsie Shield the perfect woman, health-wise. Never sick, uh, not a blemish on her. And she was five foot seven and she weighed 171 pounds. So her BMI would have made her decidedly overweight. So to probe a bit further, um, you know, we wanted to see, okay, what kind of life did she actually have? Uh, we pulled death records, uh, tracked down her grandchildren, um, dug up old newspaper articles about Elsie's uh, perfection. And here's one. Um, this was like a big story in 1912. And this story compares her to uh, the Venus de Milo, but not entirely favorably, but it does point out that at least Elsie Scheel had, had arms. It's a good <laughs> um, now, it turns out that she lived a really long life. She lived to almost 91 years old. I think she died like a week before her 91st birthday. But um, the reasons appear to have much more to do with her healthy lifestyle and her sort of confident uh, personality than, than anything really related to her weight. So I saw using her story um, as a way not only to kind of make, you know, a, a subject that could be kind of dry, um, more entertaining, but also it's kind of a way to signal, you know, we can only take this relationship between death and weight so far, and there's a lot more that we don't know. Um, and that's something that I um, uh, personally feel one of the things that I pay a lot of attention to. I try to um, make it clear what science doesn't know yet. Uh, science is this evolving discipline and um, often, you know, two steps forward, one step back or sideways and it's, 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 there's a lot of confusing information out there and I think our responsibility is to say what we know but also what we don't know. Um, so this, I'm, I'm pandering now with a cute cat photo, you can, um, um, but no, actually this was for a story that I did on a cat named Holly, who got separated from her family in Florida and made the 200-mile journey back um, on her own. And my story was 
I was asked to look at, you know, how could she have done this, and my story basically said scientists have no idea. Um, you know, it could be, it was it sound? Did she navigate by smell? Did, did she have magnetic fields like some, you know, pigeons do? Um, it turns out there's not much scientific dogma on cat navigation. Um, but after the story ran, I did hear from somebody calling herself a cat communicator who said that, you know, all we really would need to do is talk to Holly um, and find out. So I, 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 I fell short on the reporting end here. I obviously didn't do a good enough job. But I did have fun um, writing this story because I was able to slip some literary references past the editors. I always like to do that. Um, Carl Sandburg and Truman Capote, in this case, um, into a paragraph that actually ended up sparking um, kind of a little literature geek fan following in our comments, on our online comments and little Twitter uh, action. Um, so I'll just read you this, and you can roll your eyes at the end of it. Um, One glimpse through the factual fog comes on the little cat's feet. While Dr. Bradshaw, he was one of the scientists, uh, speculated Holly might have gotten a lift, perhaps sneaking under the hood of a truck headed, heading down I-95. Her paws suggest she was not driven all the way, nor did Holly go lightly. <laughs> um, I was thinking, I was, I was sort of putting this together, I was thinking this reminds me of being at Princeton, I don't know if they still do this, but I was in Colonial Club, and um, we had a thesis phrase, which was like, kind of everybody was sort of dared to sneak this nonsense phrase into your senior thesis. And so ours, <laughs> they don't do this anymore? Uh, um, <clears throat> ours was, I shall not merge with that blob-like thing. Um, and if you really care to figure out where I put it in, because I did, um, I, I think it's somewhere in the archives or Firestone or something. It's really the only reason to read my thesis. Uh, <laughs> um, another rule that I have is don't, be afraid to ask dumb questions. I ask a lot of questions. Um, and, and don't be afraid to say, you know, did I hear you right? Um, I, I had a vivid demonstration of this very early in my career when I worked in Atlanta. Um, another reporter was writing what was supposed to be a family-friendly feature on a brownie troop that was going to go on a field trip to a science center in Atlanta called the Fernbank. And she heard it wrong, and she didn't say, you know, really? Um, and the next day, the phones lit up with calls from irate parents because she had reported that these little seven, eight-year-old brownie girls were going not to the fern bank, but were taking a field trip to the sperm bank. Um, so it's always been a cautionary, cautionary tale. Um, so many of my stories these days kind of fall under two broad categories. Um, sort of the area of neuroscience and cognitive science and uh, mental health issues, and then the area of reproductive health, um, hormones, um, science related to gender. So basically we're talking about the brain and we're talking about sex. And I'm gonna talk to you about some stories that I've done in, in both areas, but um, I was trying to figure out, you know, should I start with the brain or should I start with sex? And, I flipped a coin, you know, heads for the brain, tails for sex. Um, so, <laughs> um, but heads won, so I'm gonna start. Um, so this year I did a story reporting, um, exploring why smoking is so much more common among people with mental illness. Um, and that's obviously a sensitive subject. There's a lot of secrecy. Uh, it's very, very challenging reporting. Um, but ultimately, we showed that psychiatric institutions had for years been supporting smoking um, among people with mental illness um, be, and using cigarettes um, as rewards for their patients if they took medication or if they followed the rules. So um, my story, we quoted letters written by hospital staff to tobacco companies actually asking for free cigarettes for their patients. Um, I visited a hospital in Louisiana where a state law required that mental hospitals allow smoking. Um, I found a hospital here in Princeton, a private uh, psychiatric hospital, that went smoke-free a few years ago and then switched back because they were losing prospective patients. And so they now um, still allow smoking even though the staff knows very well that 
people with mental illness die uh, about 20, 25 years earlier than uh, the general population and a lot of times from smoking-related diseases. And I visited a man in San Francisco whose situation, I think, er illustrated uh, the complexity of this issue because the nicotine in the cigarettes actually helps his schizophrenia in some ways, um, but the other chemicals in the smoke um, uh, make his schizophrenia medication less effective. Um, so it's, it's, it's complicated scientifically, it's complicated socially, and um, that story generated a lot of reaction. And that's the kind of story I love to do because it's, uh, uh, it, it sort of, you know, sheds some light in an area that a lot of people who have relatives with mental illness or who are mentally ill themselves know about, but it hasn't really been discussed. And, it, and it's, it's started a bit of a conversation, which is rewarding. Um, a more, um, I guess, sort of hopeful brain-related subject that I, I wrote about involved um, ways that um, uh, scientists are developing technology to help people who are blind experience some sense of sight. And um, I did uh, one piece about a device that um, basically involves electrodes um, implanted in the eye and then the uh, the person wears a kind of an eyeglass camera and has a video processor, and the system can send uh, video, uh, visual signals directly to the brain. Um, and so we'll have to see, you know, the FDA just approved that device for the first time. We'll have to see what happens there. Um, I'm kind of showing this because um, it's an amusing juxtaposition. The headline that they put on my story uh, on front page is, device offers partial vis vision for the blind. And it's, it's next to um, a photo of President Obama peering through a magnifying glass. <laughs> um, so I think this is an argument for the joy of the printed newspaper. Um, <laughs> and many people ask us how stories come about. And so here's one example. Um, a few years ago, my editor uh, asked me, you know, what I'd be interested in pursuing, and, and I, I said, you know, I think I'd like to take a look at Alzheimer's disease. And her reaction, which is very logical, um, and gives you some idea of the threshold that we have to cross when we consider what to write about, was um, she was very skeptical that we'd be able to find anything new to write about Alzheimer's disease, because we, the paper had been writing for years that uh, treatments that were being tested on people with dementia were, were doing very, very little. But she said, you know, you can poke around. Is for me, kind of famous last words. Um, and so I poked around, and eventually I stumbled on a reference to a family in Colombia. Um, and I reached out to someone who reached out to someone and um, discovered that this family of about 5,000 people is the world's largest to suffer from Alzheimer's disease. They have um, a genetic mutation that causes them to get Alzheimer's um, very young. They start getting symptoms around age 45. So I, I went to Colombia and um, visited members of the family in Medellin and in sort of the mountain villages um, in the Andes. And this took, us, took some doing. We had to take some special security precautions in some places. Um, there was one area that was ravaged by um, drug and guerrilla violence where the photographer and I were, were told we were the, the first gringos that anyone can remember seeing there. Um, and here's a, this is a picture of two members of the same family. This is a family where four of the siblings now have Alzheimer's. They're being uh, cared for by their 82-year-old mother. Um, and uh, the woman in bed is probably about 60. She's very advanced in the disease, and the man in the middle is probably about 48 or 50, I think. Um, he's in the early stages where he has symptoms that are obvious to people who uh, encounter him, but he's in, in the stage where he denies that he has any symptoms. Um, and the, the two other people, it's a, a Colombian scientist and a, an American scientist, and we spent a, number, uh, a lot of time with these scientists. And we concluded that this was not just a compelling story about um, uh, you know, people struggling with a terrible disease, but that there was also potentially groundbreaking science going on here because um, uh, with this family, the scientists were 
were focusing on a different way of attacking Alzheimer's by seeing if it could be prevented. Um, and they were going on the theory that maybe the drugs that have been tested so far, maybe it's not that they don't work, but they've been doing too little because they're being tried way too late. And that once you already have symptoms of dementia, the brain is already so damaged. So with this family, because they know who's going to get it, they're able to start early and, um, and, and try um, a drug before, before any kind of symptoms develop. Um, we're told that due in part to our stories, um, this project became one of the very few that were chosen for um, federal funding on, under the first national Alzheimer's plan. And uh, drug testing is going to start uh, soon, I think, this year. Um, and it's the first time uh, that people certain to develop <coughs> Alzheimer's but who do not yet have symptoms will be given a drug to prevent it. And it's actually the first time that this kind of trial has been done for any kind of genetically predestined disease. Um, so as a, uh, one of the things that we also did because, um, you know, with the times we're looking for different ways um, to illustrate stories, we produced these sort of multimedia projects. Um, and this one has a little bit of video, um, some still photos, and some originally composed music as well. And I'm, this is just a snippet of it. Let me see. Hopefully I can figure out how to do this. Cuando están empezando a enfermar, tienen cambios horribles. Yo no le deseo esto ni al perro más bravo. No. Es la enfermedad más aterradora que existe en la tierra. In most of the world, a parent starts forgetting and the children begin caretaking. But in the mountain villages of northwestern Colombia, there's a ruthless reversal. People are getting Alzheimer's so young. Laura Cuartas has watched four of her children get sick, all beginning in their 40s. Laura and her children are members of the largest family in the world to suffer from Alzheimer's. They are victims of a single genetic mutation that has touched the lives of the lineage of 5,000 people. Now she's 82 and a widow. Her husband, who had Alzheimer's, died almost 20 years ago. With the help of her daughter Gloria, she cares for the ones who suffer from the disease. As a result of that story, I think my editor was convinced there was something, uh, something here, and, and a colleague and I have ended up doing a series of stories on um, kind of groundbreaking um, science in Alzheimer's. Um, and actually, the Times is going to uh, publish an ebook of some of our work soon, I think. Um, and one of the places I traveled to um, was uh, South Korea where uh, I was writing about um, inventive caregiving efforts, including um, training children to care for elderly people with dementia. It was very moving. Um, and I also spent time, um, did time maybe, um, in, a, in a California prison with uh, first degree murderers who um, are trained to take care of other first degree murderers who have Alzheimer's disease because the state, uh, there's, su there's such an aging population in prison, and the state um, cannot afford to hire professional caregivers to take care of them. Um, since that story ran, some other prison systems in other states have uh, said that they're going to start developing programs like that. Um, it was fascinating, and I'm going to play a little bit of the video uh, that goes with this one to give you an idea. Cecil Montgomery was convicted of first-degree murder. I knocked her unconscious, tied her up, and stabbed her. And I denied doing it for at least 17 years. I killed my sister-in-law.
This program is in place because states like California cannot afford to hire professional caregivers. And people like Mr. Cruz often need care around the clock. He'll see his reflection in his toilet water and he'll talk to it, you know, as though it's his brother. You know, he'd thank his brother right there in the toilet water. If that cell door is not open, I'm not able to, to distract him, to get him away from it. And me not being able to get in there, I feel helpless. <laughs> Dementia can make people paranoid or confused, and the strict routine of prison life can exacerbate those feelings. I never take a shower. Matter of fact, you take a shower almost every day. I don't take a shower. You took one the other day. No. Yes, I you didn't. did. I didn't. Yes, you did. I didn't. I was there when you did it. All right. If that's the truth, then that's Yes, what that's I the have truth. To do. Okay. Then that's what I have to do. Okay, here, take your socks off first. A year ago, well, I couldn't have said, well, you know what, man, I'm going to go help this grown man, you know, get in the shower who just, you know, had an accident. Okay, so uh, that was the brain. Now we'll go to sex. I do have a little video for one of those stories, but I think I'm going to make you wait till the end for that one. Um, <laughs> Um, so now, you know, not surprisingly, stories about sexual and reproductive health um, can be tricky and they, and they generate considerable interest. Um, so take one story I did about the withdrawal method. Um, this was a study that showed that uh, withdrawal um, was almost as effective at preventing pregnancy as condoms. This is not what people think and it's actually not what sex educators teach. Um, but it turned out that if you look at the way uh, these methods are used in real life, um, uh, I think it was 82% for withdrawal and 83% for condoms. So this prompted some disbelieving reactions from our readership. Um, and, uh, and this email. Regarding your article on withdrawal, you referenced several times doing it right, but, but don't include any specifics. How come? Can you direct me to a source for this information? You know, I try, I, I try to be helpful. I, I referred him to the Kama Sutra. And, and, uh, um, <clears throat> so more controversy erupted over a story that, uh, on research showing that men's testosterone levels drop when they have children and go lower the more childcare they actually provide. And, uh, uh, this guy ends up being sort of our front page poster child for low testosterone, lucky him. Um, <clears throat> one email I received about that story said, this is why I have always refused to do any female work and have many mistresses and girlfriends. <laughs> men must be men. <clears throat> and there was more, but actually I'm not so sure it's times in to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but I, I did write this uh, gentleman back and I uh, couldn't resist thanking him for his enlightening email. Um, yeah, I've also written about women's reproductive health and related issues, stories like um, efforts to defund, uh, defund Planned Parenthood, um, debates on whether hospitals should be giving um, new moms samples of baby formula, Pregnancy centers set up to discourage women from having abortions. Um, and just recently, I wrote a piece on the science behind the question of whether fetuses can feel pain. Um, these areas where, where politics intersects with health um, can be particularly challenging. Um, and what I found is that if you actually look at the science and you look at the real people who are affected, things are almost always more complex and more nuanced than either side of the political spectrum um, reflects in, in their talking points. Um, so one question that we examined um, was if morning after pills, which are taken after pregnancy, uh, after sex to prevent pregnancy, can prevent fertilized eggs from implanting in the womb or if they act only before fertilization. So, this is important in abortion debates because 
Anti-abortion advocates believe that life begins once an egg is fertilized, and so therefore anything blocking fertilized eggs from planting in, uh, in the uterus is, in, to the, in their view, an abortion pill. Um, this is not the way that most conventional scientists and medical organizations look at it because um, since many fertilized eggs fail to implant on their own naturally, the sort of conventional de definition of pregnancy is that it starts after implantation. But, um, but this is important to abortion opponents and it came up in the presidential race and in allegations that Obamacare, um, by mandating coverage of birth control, also mandates coverage of abortion drugs. That's an issue that's still going on. Now, abortion opponents did not make up the idea that uh, morning after pills may affect implantation. Um, that possibility is actually right on the FDA label, um, which says that the pill mostly works by pre preventing ovulation, which is the release of the egg before fertilization, but that it might also block implantation. And that language, because it's on the FDA label, has been picked up on um, websites for the public run by the National Institutes of Health and the Mayo Clinic and others. Um, but our reporting found that the implantation effect actually was never supported by science and that studies now show strong evidence that the most common pills like Plan B1 step um, don't interfere with implantation and the one other pill that's out, out there, there's, there's studies show no evidence that it does interfere. Um, this is a story, uh, I mean, I, I, we take a lot, I, I try to take tremendous care with every story. I write this story in particular. Um, I read hundreds of pages of FDA transcripts, um, scientific studies. I talked to people involved in the original uh, approval of the drugs, the manufacturers, scientists. And importantly, I think, I sought out um, thoughtful people on both sides, not those who could sort of give a, a facile ideological quote, but people who actually followed the science, including um, an organization of anti-abortion obstetricians. And I reviewed any research that um, abortion opponents mentioned and, and really carefully considered all of their points. And I did the same thing with the FDA, which initially declined to talk to, with me about this at all. Um, but I kept um, amassing more material and sending them more detailed questions. And um, one day the FDA spokeswoman um, got back to me and she said that top officials had reviewed my questions and come to the following conclusion. Well, she's not stupid, <laughs> which I consider it high praise. Um, and then they followed that with an on-the-record statement that essentially acknowledged that the label on Plan B One Step is wrong in saying that there's this impl implantation effect. Um, and I, I'm told that this is really kind of an extraordinary thing for the FDA to do for a drug that's still on the market. Um, as a result of that story, the NIH and the Mayo Clinic changed their websites. Um, the New York Times, we changed our website too. We had a, a definition of emergency contraception that actually included this implantation effect, and that's gone now. And there was, um, you know, some criticism from abortion opponents, as expected, but um, nobody could challenge the reporting. And some people in the anti-abortion community uh, evaluated the facts in the story, including a columnist who wrote that because of our story, he was now convinced that taking Plan B, um, this is a quote from his column, cannot logically be equated with abortion. In fact, science and common sense suggests that more frequent use won't cause an increase in abortion. It will, as a result, a fewer unwanted pregnancies cause just the opposite, a continuing decrease in abortion that everyone should be happy about. Now, when we started reporting that story, you know, the, I think the key thing to say is that I had no idea what the answer was going to be and had no dog in that fight. And that's really what drives me in anything that I do. But with these controversial issues, you know, it's, it's getting to the truth, whatever it is, um, regardless of which way the conclusion falls, and also trying to be very respectful of the different viewpoints in these debates. Um, with every story, um, we work hard to be thorough and careful, and just a few, recently, actually, um, I, uh, after a couple of days of reporting a story, I told my editors that we shouldn't run it. Um, the story had been scheduled, a photo had been assigned, and I'd read the study that the story was based on, I talked to one of the researchers, it seemed solid. But then I 
um, interviewed the source of the data that the authors had analyzed and was persuaded that their methodology was too weak to um, support what could have, could have been, to some people, a fairly alarming conclusion. So um, that, may, that's, that study may appear on a blog somewhere. Somebody else may write about it. But we didn't feel like it met our threshold for responsibility to our readers. And no, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Um, um, now, if you're, if you're a New York Times reader, you know um, that sexual vocabulary is something the Times frequently goes to great lengths to uh, exclude or euphemize, or euthanize, oh, no. <laughs> so uh, covering the subject can be a lexicographical challenge. Um, but I found that uh, this can vary based on where the story runs. So in a story on male contraceptives, um, an initial draft that was edited by the science editors quoted a scientist saying that a drug that, was, um, that blocks sperm production was being tested on rabbits quote, trained to ejaculate into a fake vagina. Um, yeah, it's very visual, right? Um, but when the story was chosen to run on the Sunday front page, those editors said that that line would not pass the uh, crucial Sunday brunch test. Um, I think, you know, people were going to gag on their eggs benedict or spit out their mimosas or something. I don't, I don't know. So ultimately, what ran said only that the drug was being tested on rabbits. For a writer, this is just, this kills you, you know. <laughs> anyway, now you know. Um, and this, this guy, uh, he was one of the volunteers in the, um, in the sperm blocking uh, contraceptive study. And I still don't know why we photographed him with his iguana. Because <laughs> There, there was no mention in any of the drafts of the story of iguana vaginas, so I, I, I don't know where it came from. But, but you know, in a story about preventing HIV infections in Africa by circumcising men, um, this circumcision story, by the way, ran in a special issue of Science Times called Small Fixes. Um, <laughs> I got to use this quote. <clears throat> We're hacking away at it every month. Though, <laughs> Those four skins are flying. Um, we got no complaining letters. Um, somebody, somebody did suggest that flying four skins would make a great name for a band. <laughs> so I, I'm going to suggest it to the guys in my jazz group. Um, actually, this, this was one of the liberating things about writing um, my book, I'll In Practice. There's a, uh, there's exam for example, there's a section in the book on odd things people insert where they ought not go, um, like cucumbers and plungers and ballpoint pens and paintbrushes. Um, and uh, uh, after publication, we had several um, networks and Hollywood production companies bid to turn the book into a TV series. And um, I'm told they always mentioned that section. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Um, the winning bidder uh, was Imagine Television, which is Ron Howard's production company. And uh, there's a draft um, that's, you know, who knows what will happen with that, but there's a draft of a pilot script written by Amy Holden Jones, who's a feature film writer who's written movies like um, Mystic Pizza <coughs> and Indecent Proposal. And there is, in fact, in that, uh, a small little anecdote of somebody putting a vegetable where vegetables should not be. Um, but the script, it does take care to be medically accurate, so I'm happy with that. Um, and I don't have a picture of that, but uh, <laughs> this, um, this, is the, this is actually the doctor um, who Island Practice is about. Um, and I'm going to let you read the book to try to figure out uh, why he has all these guns. And it's not because he didn't like the book. Um, all right, so you were promised a sex-related video. Um, this is from a recent story about trying to create condoms that men will actually want to use. Um, so there's a serious public policy component here. Um, condoms you know, cheaply and effectively prevent um, HIV and unintended pregnancies, and these cause huge amounts of suffering in the developing world. But um, too few men will use them. Um, so we wrote about efforts to change the fit, uh, the material, the packaging, to address what's called the donning problem. 
um, by making them easier to put on. Um, glow in the dark condom, spray on condoms, even the Obama condom stimulus package. Um, <laughs> which happened, it's a real thing, it has our president emblazoned on the prophylactic. Um, anyway, I could go on, but I'm gonna let this video, uh, this, is, this is kind of a bold video for the New York Times, actually. Uh, so there you go. Uh, we have ice cream, we have lychee, mango, and even durian flavored that comes from Ooh. China. Pia Tepers works for the United Nations Family Planning Agency, and her goal is to decrease unplanned pregnancies and sexually transmitted diseases like HIV. These are big problems in the developing world, and there are 2.5 million new HIV infections every year. You are not going to believe it, but this is also a condom. <laughs> Ms. Deperth has been trying to offer different designs, flavors, and packaging, anything to make condoms more appealing and fun. She and others have been working on this problem for years, but now the issue is getting some attention from Bill and Melinda Gates. Their foundation is offering $100,000 to $1 million to applicants who can come up with the most promising new condom designs. What you would find really uh, tasty and uh, might not be something that I would like. So it's really important to understand that we are all, not all the same. Similarly, condom should be coming only on one time. It has to be a little bit of everything. The Gates Foundation is looking for something so different and user-friendly that it can actually enhance pleasure. So far, they've had over 500 submissions. They're not discussing the details, but they say people have sent them samples. In the front, we have a piece of leather. We can be pretty sure that this one, promoted on YouTube, is not a serious entry. Though the slingshot condom may seem impractical, Fire. That one key issue. Condoms are annoying to put on. The packaging part is actually one of the biggest really? for me. Because you can't, you have to open it without, you have to be like really careful to not rip it right, or something true. like that. And so like if there was some way to make that easier and then, take one hand, for example. That's true, but then also you have to think about like the packaging has to be strong enough that if it's, I mean things can, but that you won't really perforate it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I'm, and that's why I don't know how to do any of these things. Known as the, this is the world's smallest condom. This is called the hat condom. It but plenty of people are working on the condom use problem as we speak. Well, the problem with this is it fell off and then people had to retrieve it. So, Ron Frazier is one of those people and he works for the California Family Health Council, which helps test condoms and other birth control methods. In most cases, people are fairly conservative. Pharmaceutical companies don't want to expand and do research on huge amounts of new materials because it's so expensive, and they don't know if the market's going to ultimately be there. Another less than successful design was the spray-on condom. Many other designs have worked, but none of them have been a slam dunk favorite with everybody. Because the number one reason people are having sex for is for pleasure. So a vibrating ring, and we have a few here. Abidia de Paris suggests taking a plain Jane condom and accessorizing. And because it's coming close to the woman, she's also feeling it. And most of the batteries would last about 20 minutes. Oh, I think you were telling me that um, some of the men you were talking to were complaining that 20 minutes was too short. Listen, you're supposed to have sex for pleasure without this. This is just enhancing your pleasure for most men. 10 minutes is a maximum. 20 minutes is like... <laughs> I mean, let's be realistic here. 10 minutes is like, I would say, the average. All right, so I can't follow that with anything better, so... Um, <laughs> um, so I guess I uh, could open it up for questions. Are they supposed to go to the microphone? Or? Well, um, that's true. I have a, uh, the Times is, is still extremely committed to investing in stories that they think are worthwhile. We, we have to make the case um, for travel like that. That kind of thing is very expensive. Um, 
and it's a little harder, you know, the, the threshold is a little higher um, than it used to be. But, um, uh, but we're talking about doing something similar, um, you know, that involves foreign travel next year. Uh, some of my colleagues do that. And, you know, we pick our, our, our shots, we pick our, uh, we pick something that we think is going to be really worthwhile and that can only be il illustrated um, or can best be illustrated by being on the ground. Um, so um, it, we're very fortunate to work at a place that still has that as a, as a commitment. Um, so there's like been a lot of talk recently, I guess, about like show the videos and how sort of new forms of content, like videos, Twitter, um, even like Facebook, or even like Instagram kind of photos um, can change, changing the media landscape. And I was sort of wondering how you or the Times and specifically like the health um, industry are telling the health story. How are those new forms of content changing that? Right, that's a good question. Is everybody able to hear the question? Um, so we are doing a lot um, with different forms of media like that. And it, it just keeps, uh, we keep developing and we keep trying new things. Um, you know, something like the multimedia presentations, the first two, the, the Alzheimer's ones, those we have to be, that's, that's, that, that takes a tremendous um, investment of time and resources because that is really almost creating, um, uh, you know, you're, you're telling the story. It takes a lot of editing and script writing and narration and music. Those we do for some stories. Um, something like the condom video takes a little bit less time. Um, we're doing that for a number of stories as well. We're doing a lot of interactive stuff. Um, we do, we'll put out um, sort of a Twitter call um, on a story and say, you know, hey, tell us, I think we did that with the condom story actually. Um, give us, you know, tell us when, you know, why you don't want to use condoms or why you do or something like that. Um, so there's been a lot of that kind of thing. Um, they're doing more and more with mobile and designing different apps and, um, you know, sort of, uh, we just actually, the science section just started something, I think last week, um, called Science Takes, which is um, video, they're, uh, um, they're, we're looking, a lot of times researchers will, in the course of their research, they'll take video, and it's available, and they're not, maybe the thing that they found isn't like incredibly groundbreaking, it's not really enough for us to do a story, but it's like a really cool video of a shark or something like that, and there's like a little finding that could be interesting. Um, and so we're taking some of this video, some of it's really good quality, and doing like, you know, a minute or two of that, and we'll amass an archive of that, and th that can be really useful for, you know, regular web users, but you can also see it for students. Um, so there's a lot of that going on. talked about the political neutrality that you have to have um, when you address the story, yet we often see that different media outlets have their own political identity. So I wonder where in the process do you feel like maybe the political identity is put onto a story or an angle, or maybe why that wouldn't happen at the New York Times, but would happen in other places, if you can speak to that. Um, it's a question about political neutrality in stories. I, I, you know, I really can't speak about what other places do. Um, I know that um, for, for us, and this is something I feel very committed to, I mean, I'm, I am, the thing that I'm most committed to is finding out what's really happening. And that um, is, that's the, that's the ideology that drives me more than really anything else. So, you know, look, I'm, I'm a chocoholic. <laughs> and there are uh, various studies, like the other day I saw a study in the Journal of Experimental Biology that said chocolate makes snails smarter. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then there was another study recently that something about chocolate being used um, to delay cognitive decline in people. So I would like nothing better than for this to be true, and for <laughs> and and for you know to be able to write you know page one story in the New York Times saying chocolate, um, and definitely being able to go on the ground you know and do field research in this area, um, but the science is just not there yet. Um, so 
uh, and maybe it won't be, you know. Um, so, uh, to me, you know, I, I, I can resist it <laughs> because, because the drive to do the science, um, to, to do the reporting is, is, the, is the thing that um, supersedes everything. Did I answer your question? Sorry? Right, okay. <laughs> Yes. I guess there are a lot of related though. I'm wondering, since you're doing these really science-based stories, not being a scientist yourself, and you do have sort of conflicting sources, how you might, uh, like, are there sources you turn to to help you look at different like, experimental models and things like that? Yeah. Right, very good question, you know, how to, especially since I'm not somebody who's trained as a scientist, um, how do I know what sources to, uh, to pay attention to in sight? And um, a combination of things. You know, I do a lot of, a lot, I do a lot of research. Um, I read the studies. Sounds like that would be a no-brainer, but actually, you know, a, a, a lot of times people maybe in other publications or writing st stories and you, you can just tell that they didn't actually read the study. Um, and I ask a lot of questions. Um, so I just try to sort of satisfy myself that I can figure out what it is that they're talking about. Um, I talk to colleagues. There's a wealth of, uh, of uh, expertise um, among you know, some of my colleagues who may have written about these subjects you know, years ago and can say, oh yeah, I remember that, or yeah, this is really kind of different. Um, and then, you know, I try to find, I, I do PubMed searches, you know, I try to find people who have really written about each subject, um, w you know, well, and you, you can kind of tell after talking to people who's credible and who's not, who has been, you know, if, you, if you're writing about an area where uh, there's been a handful of studies, but they've all been kind of done by the same guy with maybe other teams, then, you know, you, that gives you pause. Um, so there are different red flags that crop up along the way, and there's no perfect solution, but it's just like trying to use your head and trying to, trying to be careful, trying to reflect. Uh, I, I always ask people, uh, scientists, what would your critics say? What would they say about this? And usually, if they're a good scientist, they'll say, well, they'll just tell, they'll say my sample size is too small, or they'll say this or that. And then, you know, sometimes I ask them who their biggest critics are, and they'll tell me. And, you know, you can, it's part feel, and it's part a lot of hard work. Yeah. So uh, I'll always remember a quote from Boyce Remsberger, a pretty ah, yeah. darn good science writer, who said, science should be about the endless capacity to fascinate and the joy of discovery. So I wonder how, one, you as a journalist factor that into your own writing and your own thinking, although the snail and chocolate story gives me a little bit of a clue. Right. But also, as a mom and an observer, what are we falling short in how we're teaching science and communicating science at the lower grade levels and through high school? And I'm, I'm just interested in your perspective on both of both. Uh, yeah, well, on the first one, um, I mean, really, the first test is that it has to surprise me. It has to be something that, uh, that I, I look at and, and say, well, that seems counterintuitive. I didn't know that. Now, as a non-scientist, um, I get surprised by things that maybe some of my colleagues don't. And that's part of the reason why I think I'm one of the people in the department. Uh, because I, I bring a little bit more. I, I come, as um, the introduction said, you know, I come as from, from a generalist perspective, most uh, 10 years as a National Bureau Chief. So I, I'm sort of the person who kind of puts together the science with the people aspect and the policy aspect. Um, and sometimes I get surprised by something and I'm persuaded that it's not surprising at all. But other times, like with the Alzheimer's thing, um, or really almost any of the stories that I described here, um, maybe some of my colleagues were underwhelmed, but it turned out when, I, when you poke into it, there's actually something interesting there. So you have to trust your instincts. Um, I don't know a lot about science education in, in schools in general. It's not something I've written about. Um, I do think about it with my own kids. And um, I'm, I've been very happy to see 
um, in, at least in the courses, that, the classes that they're taking. I mean, they're, they're in fifth and eighth grade. Um, and uh, they're, they're getting, you know, a chance to do a lot of hands-on stuff. And, um, and uh, <laughs> actually, one of my older daughter just told me that she's using one of my stories to write some sort of science project. I was like, is that okay? Said, yeah. <laughs> and so she was grilling me, you know, what are your sources here? <laughs> um, so that's good. So, I, you know, I, 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 there's one of my colleagues, Ken Chang, knows a lot about this actually, and, and I'm sure it's falling short in a lot of places, but, um, uh, but it's, I, I'm glad to see that what my kids are getting is better than what I got for sure. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure how to ask this, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to figure it out. Later. Okay. Uh, when you were introduced, <laughs> yeah. you were introduced as having written X number of articles. Right. Okay. Um, to what extent are you evaluated on the articles that don't make, the, that aren't in the newspaper, but rather are reported digitally, are reported online? You said you get a lot of emails. Now, presumably, um, uh, I don't know whether you're copying your editor on your responses oh, or the good you're doing ones. something, but how much of your evaluation, as more and more of the world is going digital, granted the New York Times is growing, is going, um, and losing less readers than, than most any other newspaper other than perhaps the journal, um, to what extent are you helping to make the science section more relevant for digital readers? Oh, I think we're doing a tremendous amount of that. Um, you know, I mean, me personally, um, uh, every story I do, I think, every single story I've done, um, appears on the web. And sometimes there have been a few things that have appeared only on the web, just because of the way print deadlines were happening or... Um, but the New York Times so, app is yeah. basically the newspaper. Yeah. Now the website's not, but the, the app is. Is yeah. there going to be? Yes, they are app? doing, and I, I really can't speak to that, although I was just on a, uh, in a meeting uh, where some of that was being discussed, but it's not really, uh, I don't have expertise on the apps, but I know that they are um, constantly retooling the apps, and they're in the process of developing something that will be um, more reflective of, you know, what's happening online. It's it's a it's a balancing act. Obviously, people want different things. Um, they've done a lot of looking at sort of when people use apps, like seven o'clock in the morning when you're you know getting dressed. Um, in, you know, there's a flood of app activity, and then that sort of tapers off apparently. And then, you know, around lunchtime when you know, you're supposed to be doing something productive. You're noodling around on the web, and you know they, they have they they're they're doing a lot of a lot of looking at that. And this my department, you know, health and science is just a perfect um, laboratory. We're not the only ones. The whole paper's doing it. But there are so many ways that you can use um, uh, all of these the, all of these range of media to enhance. You know, storytelling and um, uh, an understanding of health and science. So, well, in part because the New York Times is still spending money on health and science, whereas few other yes. publications today, other than those that are just for health and science, right? As a, as, a, as a general publication, the New York Times is doing the best job of anybody in the country. Thank you. Um, I, I'm very grateful that they that they are investing in it. Um, it's consistently, uh, you know, they've, they've shut down uh, sections, some of the separate sections. They've kept our section, even though we get almost no actual advertising in the print section, which baffles me. It has a huge, I mean, I've been on Metro North when it's running. Um, <laughs> and, um, and on a Tuesday, and um, the conductor has walked through and said, does anybody have the Tuesday science section? Because I collect them, and when I don't have time to read them, I, I save them up. You know, I'm just sitting there going, oh, okay, I've got to start in there. Um, you know, it, 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 they are aware that it attracts uh, a, a very wide and interested readership, and um, 
and that they're, we're one of the few places still doing it, so thank you. Yes. How really are uh, most of the scientists that you work with and things to share their knowledge and information, or do they like to keep parts of it embargoed until they're ready to release it? I mean, are you constantly on the typewriter? Oh, uh, yeah, I think that varies. I mean, how, how willing are scientists to talk about their research? Um, uh, well, first of all, there are, you know, uh, almost every study comes with an embargo, which we always respect. Um, uh, and um, so, as a result, I'm often talking to people, you know, days or sometimes even weeks before their study comes out, um, promising not to actually publish it until the embargo is lifted. But a lot of times, you know, people will be working on something else, and they'll say, well, um, you know, they've done a study on X, and I'll say, okay, but have you looked at Y? And they'll say, well, you know, that's a good question. That's actually the focus of our next study, and it's been sort of provisionally accepted for publication, and, uh, but I can't talk about it. Sometimes they talk about it anyway. Um, sometimes they don't, and, you know, we just try to deal with it. I usually, I usually go over with them and say, okay, well, can I say that you're, you're looking at this question as well? And, you know, we just, again, it's just kind of, negotiating what they feel comfortable with. difficult. Um, you know, it, I think we, we, uh, we want to write about something often that has results to show for it, um, or has some conflict, um, or some debate, um, or something like Alzheimer's where they've been plugging away for years and there, you know, there's no results. Um, uh, so, it's hard to write about a program. We don't write about programs very often. Um, there are just so many of them. But I think it, it, it depends. I mean, if it's something really inventive, if it's a really different way of solving a problem, um, uh, you know, if there's a very uh, compelling example of a family that you have, you know, kind of helped in some way. Um, you know, nothing is off the table. It's just, it has to kind of, it just has to meet some kind of, uh, some kind of, you know, has to have some kind of alchemy to it that, 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 that grabs us as a story, you know. It's hard, so it's hard to, hard, hard to answer that question theoretically, I guess, is saying. <laughs> what else? Oh, back there. Yeah, um, today, uh, thousands of books uh, are being cataloged each year. Maybe a hundred years ago, only a hundred. Um, or hundreds. Um, uh, how's a reader uh, to determine what's worthwhile? There's, Thousand books uh, written about Lincoln or Washington, all these things. So, um, how are you to ask the question? How you uh, determine what has value? And I don't mean a monetary, but a knowledge value or whatever you're looking for. Are you talking about books or or just in general or just stories? The deluge of uh, the amount of stuff of information out there. That's, uh, yeah. That's out there now. Yeah. Compared to uh, just a century ago, or even a half a century ago, how does anybody make sense out of this? 
Yeah. Um, how do you make sense of all the all the input that's out there? Well, that's 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 a big part of my one you know one of the things that I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and I mean, uh, you first. Yeah. Where, where do you see this going as, um, you know, as a situation? Yeah, it's a hard question. I mean, you know, there are benefits to having all of that option, uh, all those choices out there, right? Um, you know, there's different people get to tell their view of the same story, so. Yeah, but how do you find it? You can't read this out. So, I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's. I don't know. I mean, part of it is just um, what, what seems to be important, and um, part of that is what you actually hear about, right? So there's not, an it's, there's not a fairness about it, is there? It's, uh, it's kind of, you know, something interests me, it doesn't interest my colleague, well, she's not gonna write about it. I might, but I might not get to it either. So it's, it, it's really hard to, it's hard to know. It's, it's, it's an argument for having, uh, I guess, in, if you think about it from the point of view of the New York Times, is having sort of, you know, working at a place that's committed to sort of ferreting out that stuff separating the wheat from the chaff. We do the best we can. And with that. <laughs>